Next, here in the skylight room, uh, Cody Swift uh, has worked as a guide in the psilocybin anxiety cancer study at Johns Hopkins University and is currently conducting qualitative research into the nature of psychospiritual change with psychedelics in a clinical setting with MDMA and psilocybin. And Alexander Belser co-founded the psychedelic research team at NYU in 2006. He's the lead investigator of a qualitative study at NYU exploring how patients with cancer experience psilocybin-assisted psychotherapy. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is Cody Swift, and this is Alex Belzner. And uh, thank you all for coming. Really, uh, this has been a huge labor of love for both of us. And uh, I think we started, what was it, five years ago? Four or five years ago. So this has been a long, long time coming. And our qualitative paper is finally in press in the Journal of Humanistic Psychology. So we'll have that going soon. Um, yes, thank you. So, uh, yes. Just to begin with a, a quote from William James, uh, the keynote of the mystical experience is invariably a reconciliation. It is as if the opposites of the world whose contradictoriness and conflict make all our difficulties and troubles were melted into unity. And uh, not to completely give away our study, but this is the core of it, and he figured it out over a hundred years ago, but we're doing it again. And that was after his uh, nitrous oxide experiences. Uh, so a little insight uh, into the rationale of our, uh, our qualitative project. Uh, Alex and I, uh, we were involved in the psychedelic field and, and we're close to NYU and Hopkins. And so we were, we were hearing that there were a lot of remarkable changes that were happening. And we knew that at some point there would be a quantitative study that was going to demonstrate numerically how important these uh, transformations were and, and you know, large effect sizes. Um, but we knew that it would be really lacking in communicating the depth and the beauty of transformation. And, um, and really kind of the, the, the nuances of, of what is changing in people's experiences. And we knew that uh, psychedelic psychotherapy is so meaning-laden and is so part of an experiential journey that to, to only leave it to numerical uh, results would, would completely miss the mark. And so we set out to design a study that would really try to capture the, the nuance and, and essence of uh, psychological change with psilocybin for people who are dying. And societally, we felt this was really important because um, the data would come out, and this is not a typical treatment modality. It's not uh, uh, psychopharmacology Traditionally, it's not giving people medications, it's not talk therapy, it's something else. So people are going to be looking at this remarkable data and scratching their heads and wondering, well, how, how is it that this is happening? Is this, is this fantasy and trying to give some nuance? Um, and thirdly, the existential piece was hugely important to us. Um, death anxiety is... Uh, is rampant, especially in our culture. And as Ernest Becker said, uh, death anxiety is really the driver of so much of our neuroses and our destruction of the planet and cultures and is really at the root of the, of the problem, so to speak. And so if we could, we could capture um, a modality that was actually helping, to, helping people to overcome death anxiety uh, and, and getting a glimpse into how that was happening, uh, it would be quite remarkable. And lastly, I, I really, and Alex and I really wanted to convey the, the beauty and the poetry of what was happening, the psychological change, because uh, uh, as you'll see, the, the quotes and the, uh, the psychological change is just is remarkable. Um, so Alex is going to share a little bit about the parent study. 
Thanks, Cody. Hi, everybody. You seem so far away. <laughs> Hi. Yes, I get I'm getting waves from friends in the back. Uh, so this study uh, just came out in December. Uh, it, we published it in conjunction. That this is the quantitative study, uh, and it, it it yielded remarkable results. David Nutt called uh, it one of the mo a landmark study. One of the most, uh, it is the most rigorous, uh, the study that we did with uh, NYU and also at Hopkins, the most rigorous double-blind placebo-controlled trial of a psychedelic drug in the past 50 years. Um, so what was interesting about this trial was that we were treating people with existential distress related to cancer. And we found, um, Unlike most people who are treated with antidepressants, if they have depression related to cancer or anxiolytic medications, uh, we had much higher response rates. We had 70 to 80 percent response rates in our primary outcome measures for anxiety and depression in our cancer sample. Uh, and we found that these were enduring changes. So Steve Ross and Gabby uh, Agenliebes will be speaking about that. Uh, but what you'll see is when we look at anxiety and depression scores uh, between our two groups, uh, we have massive effect sizes. We have uh, massive reductions, two to three times the size uh, in reductions of leading psychopharmacological treatments. And um, this, this goes across the board for both our primary and our, our secondary outcome measures where we have um, significant reductions on the Beck Depression Inventory, uh, measures of anxiety with the state trait and state anxiety scales. But we also find um, qualitative differences, people reporting better quality of life, people recording uh, better altruism, their relationship with others improving in their lives, uh, a reduction in demoralization and hopelessness, reduced fear of death. Uh, and, some of the, and so we really wanted to look at, deeply at the qualitative research regarding this. This is the psilocybin in a tiny little vial that we keep in a 500 pound safe uh, with reinforced floors. Um, so I, I just want to focus real quickly on the methods here and then we'll get to the meat of the, the talk and I'll let Cody really sh share that with you. Um, I interviewed all of our participants. It was 13 of our participants out of the 29 in the larger parent uh, quantitative study. I sat down with people for an hour and a half to two hours in a semi-structured interview. Uh, these interviews were just transcribed verbatim. Uh, we used IPA, interpretative phenomenological analysis, which is a type of uh, method for analyzing um, rich textual data. And we did that in a collaborative group environment. So there was a group of us. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this here, of uh, four doctoral students uh, and a variety of graduate students. And we took turns doing close readings of the data, coding that data in a qualitative coding software program called Atlas TI, and then uh, assembling those codes into emergent themes. And we were looking at both the phenomenal experience that people reported, as well as the process of meaning making and sense making uh, as patients in the trial. And we wanted to ask them about things that we may, maybe had not captured when we set out and, and started giving them questionnaires on the quantitative assessments. Um, so in the analytic process, we try to be as rigorous as possible, so we're not just making things up. Uh, we'll be sharing quotations with you, but in on our uh, study, we had two people independently interpreting and coding. Uh, autonomously, and then subsequently there were two independent auditors who followed their trails trying to make sense of what they were doing and make sure that they had a coherent thought process, and one reader. So there's maximization of cross-check and analytic rigor in this study. And with that, I'm going to hand the microphone back to Cody. <clears throat> well, uh, I just wanted to really thank uh, Alex because he, he did conduct all the interviews and I can't tell you, he, he really drew out and elicited such beautiful responses from all the, the cancer patients who went through the trial. And what's so remarkable is that many of them spoke to the ineffability of the experience that you can't bring words to it. And yet they would take two hours describing in the most poetic beauty the, the depth of their journeys. And uh, so thank you, Alex. Um, uh, so to start out, uh, we really wanted to capture the, the nuance of where people were coming from. What was the nature of their anxiety and depression? What 
what was really at the core of the, the fear that they were holding. Uh, so we asked uh, questions about what their life was like before starting the trial. <clears throat> and we found that all 13 had uh, existential distress and, tr and trauma, almost PTSD-related symptoms um, uh, on their cancer. Uh, one participant, you realize you're going to die. I don't know that you realize that until you're told. I was told that I had a 50-50 chance of being alive in five years. As soon as you think about having a limited time for living, it changes everything. And so a lot of them, what they described as having confronted mortality in a, in a very significant way. And after their treatments were over, they expected to be free, be happy, be joyful, return to the life that they were living, but they could not forget what they had seen. And so they were left with this existential shock, but no way to integrate what the implications of that in their life. They couldn't just go back to their normal life. So as a result, they were anxious. They were uh, featuring uh, symptoms related to PTSD, like hypervigilance, being unable to sleep. They described running from their cancer in different ways. Um, and, and a lot of them really had a lack of support from the medical community after their treatments. As, as one woman said, there was never any counseling or anything after chemo. It was just, here are your antidepressants and have a good life kind of thing. There was nothing to help you go back and deal with this trauma that's affected your life. So a lot of the, the patients actually came to the trial at NYU looking for a different kind of treatment. They had been trying antidepressants. They had been trying talk therapy, but, but nothing was resolving this, this core wound. Uh, and so uh, they, were, they didn't really quite know what they were looking for, but they were looking for, uh, for something different. And, and uh, that's what we had, something different. Uh, and so this is the psilocybin did in the, uh, in the ceremonial chalice uh, at NYU. So as they're laying down on the couch and the effects of the psilocybin are, are coming on, uh, 10 out of the 13 participants described uh, very, very um, profoundly this, this kind of experiential immersion into the experience, uh, into the psilocybin space. They, they were not simply observers of like a television of the effects. They were immersed into this visionary landscape. They became, they merged with the emotions. They merged with the, the images. And we found this to be very significant in the healing process, that they were not just gaining insights. They were, they were feeling it. And as one woman said, it was a feeling beyond an intellectual feeling. It was a feeling to the bottom of my core. That's one reason why it's hard to talk about. It's beyond words. And another participant, feelings of being connected to everything. I mean everything in nature. And it wasn't like talking about it, which makes it an idea. It was an experiential. It was experiential. Words fail me. I was at a loss for words because it was so beyond words then. And for many of the participants, this, this degree of uh, uh, experiential immersion was not always pleasant and, uh, and beautiful. Uh, many of them actually had significant uh, distress feelings of loss of self, feelings of uh, being, being swept off at sea, uh, no boundaries, nothing to anchor to, just in the swirl of existential chaos uh, that, that caused um, some momentary anxiety for, uh, for nine out of 13 participants. <clears throat> it hit me very strong. It was terrifying. Absolutely nothing to anchor myself to. No point of reference, nothing, just lost in space. I was so scared. Then I remembered that Tony and Michelle were right there. And I reached out my hand and I said, I'm so scared. And I think it was Tony who took my hand and said, it's all right, just go with it, go with it. And I did. And this is uh, really a, a, a pivotal um, moment of the surrender the reaching out for care, 
and the encouragement to, to go into the experience. And, uh, and Tony Bosses is, uh, is here in the, in the crowd. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> Interestingly, um, three of the participants, um, we, we had quotes from them that were very, very poignant in describing that period in their, in their journey as an important struggle that uh, the psilocybin actually gave them the opportunity to confront the darkness that, that they felt they were holding and, and allowed them to turn towards it, to face it, and to move through it. And in, in that way, they felt it was a gift that they could finally, in a way that they were perhaps running from it before, they could actually uh, confront it and, and move through it. As one participant said, it, it was an intense, intense struggle, and that's where it became medicinal because it allowed that struggle to happen. It didn't code it. It wasn't an antidepressant. It brought it all out. And another, it wasn't pleasant, but part of it is like, I know I can get through anything. That was very real to me. So people, people found a deeper level of confidence in themselves to, to move through this level of, of difficulty and anxiety. And, and this is a photo of the session room, uh, Jeff Gus and another guide. Uh, <clears throat> so one of the remarkable features in this immersive visionary landscape is that a lot of the participants described uh, a profound, uh, what we would call a reconciliation with death. And they had visions and experiences where they were able to confront a place or a feeling that they actually felt was like what happens when you die. And, and all the participants who had that experience came to see that, that actually death was not scary. That they were able to make some kind of relationship to it. And the root of the word reconciliation is conciliar, which is actually to make friendly. And so by, through this confrontation, this deep experiential confrontation with death, they were able to uh, make friends with what they felt like was death. I was not here anymore. I was not with my body. I thought to myself that this is death. And it was scary, but I remember I said to myself, Oh, if this is death, it's not that bad. At least there's something. It was exotic and unknown, mysterious, something I would not mind being in because I would love to explore that. Another participant during her experience, she was having um, pain in her ad abdomen. And um, the guide encouraged her to go into that pain and explore it. She said, uh, my abdomen. That's also where the cancer was. I felt like that was my umbilical cord to the universe and that that's where life would be drained from me someday and I would surrender it willingly when my time came. It was really comforting. It kind of reaffirmed what I believe, that we're all kind of this greater whole that you go back. So actually, the, the psilocybin journey reframed even the site of her cancer as being her umbilical cord back to the universe. And, uh, and a third um, had a remarkable vision of seeing herself return. She was under, she felt like this was dealing with death. And she was in this lush kind of woods. She was down below the ground and it felt really good. And she thought, that's what happens when you die. I'm going to be reconnected to this beautiful world, this earthly world that we live in. It was just, it was gorgeous. So we also found that um, not only did participants have deep reconcili reconciliations with death, but also with their cancer. Um, and uh, one participant uh, during her session, she actually had this, this vision of a, of a beautiful round dinner table. And uh, it was a profound vision and inspired the title of this talk. <clears throat> One of the really vivid, vivid images that I had was there was a sketch of a dinner table. 
It was almost this round circle that represented a dinner table. And at the table was cancer. But it was supposed to be at the table. And the feeling I had was cancer is a part of everything. It isn't this bad separate thing. It's something that's a part of everything and that everything is a part of everything. And that's really beautiful. It was just sort of an acceptance of the human experience because it's all supposed to be that way. Everything just felt unified. And, uh, and I think she went on to say that no longer did she feel like she had to separate her life out between the good and the bad. Everything was in, in unity, even the cancer. Um, I'm going to keep moving along here. We're getting close to time. Well, one phenomenon that we felt was pretty remarkable is that um, many of the participants actually said that the, the session really had nothing to do with cancer, actually. And, uh, and cancer was kind of this, uh, this transient thing, but they felt like a lot of the, the processing that they went through was actually anxiety related to cancer. I didn't feel like it was cancer related. It was more related to the anxiety and fear that I kind of carry in my body. So it's a, a, a differentiation process that happened between the cancer and their emotional uh, process and their, and their emotional feelings related to cancer that they were able to resolve and to move through. <clears throat> Uh, many, seven out of the 13 participants actually spoke to the experience as being uh, of, a, of a religious or spiritual level of, uh, of significance. And, and many of the participants actually uh, were atheist or agnostic. And even one participant said, um, if, I were if I were religious, it definitely would have been a religious experience. <laughs> I would have said, bathed in God's love. And I don't think English really has a way to say this without using that word, God. Maybe bathed in transcendent love, bathed in universal love. It was such a strong feeling. And another pertinent to death. Uh, the psilocybin just opens you up and it connects you. Everything is interwoven, and that's a big relief. I think it does help you accept death because you don't feel alone. You don't feel like you're going to go off to, I don't know, go off into nothingness. That's the number one thing. You're just not alone. So a lot of the, the process was actually um, around uh, uh, reconciling death and cancer and com coming to deeply incorporate those difficult elements into one's being. But we also found that the healing process with psilocybin was not just about reconciliation, but was also uh, about transcendence and actually transcending above these parts of one's life and reconnecting people to, uh, to really beautiful uh, places of their, of their lives and beautiful feelings of, of joy and lightness and freedom many of whom had not felt that way since their childhood. And they described feeling the way that they felt, uh, the kind of freedom that they felt when they were children, this kind of wonderment and lightness and joy of just being a child. And uh, one participant said, uh, it was surreal because I never remember my childhood. But during the psilocybin experience, I got that sense, that whole feeling of like, everything is just right. There are no insecurities, there are no life responsibilities, no daily grind, no cancer, no nothing. It's just this pleasant childhood where I ran around after school. That feeling of freedom of just not having the weight and burden of dealing with life and death. And uh, many of the participants describe not only coming to feel that way during the session, but that it inspired a new way of living. That many of them became resolute to live more that way in their life. They described not, not wanting to plod through life anymore, that they were gonna actually live and enjoy it. And, and um, it's like waking up in the most profound way. And um, 
I know we're just about out of time, but uh, one of the more important phenomena is actually this uh, decreased um, fear of cancer recurrence that they describe. So we asked them at the end of the interview, well, you know, how do you relate to your cancer now? And uh, the participant said, I used to think about death every day. For a year and a half, I thought about death every single day. But what they described is just no longer being obsessed with it. It's not like I'm all of a sudden cool with death, but I'm just not obsessed with it. It's not the thing that controls my life. I'm not preoccupied with it. Um, one woman thought if it recurs, she's gonna, she would not go on living. She said, truthfully, I don't even think about cancer recurrence now. I really don't. But it is not a decision. It is a feeling. It is a change in how I feel that I can speak this way and be this way. And uh, last, lastly, uh, it's not something I focus on anymore. I don't focus on cancer. I know for a fact that was a huge change for me. It's not the thing that controls my life. So we have been through this journey and I think deeply touched by it and both of us have learned a lot and now I'm uh, seeing cancer patients in my clinical practice inspired by this work and we really hoped that this qualitative paper could actually inspire other caregivers even not working with psilocybin on how to how to be with cancer patients and how to understand the nuance of of a healing journey with cancer and um, and I'm really pleased to say that Alex and I are now working on our second project together which is interviewing religious clergy about their experiences in the psilocybin trial and uh, and that paper is forthcoming and we're really excited about that so thank you all you want to do this I'm sorry to say that we don't have time to have you have questions yeah no time for questions like but question. we will you can take one question oh we can take one okay Ineffable question, perhaps. Do you have a sense that psychedelic-assisted um, therapy um, lends itself more to fear of death and dying than it does to other things like trauma and violence and, and PTSD, that the, the nature of death the, the is, is, um, lends itself best in, the, in, in, in terms of outcome? Uh, I, I, I'll give Alex a chance too, but I think it's a, a really, really fabulous question and uh, I might take a little side route <laughs> in answering it, which is to say that I think that a lot of trauma is actually existential in nature, the way that trauma perforates one's existential container um, that could be addressed by psilocybin. And I also think death anxiety has trauma components. Probably early tra childhood trauma is related to later death anxiety because if you pr are projecting onto death your early childhood ex experiences, you're going to think, you know, this horrible thing, this, you know, death is going to be like the traumas of my childhood, or maybe feeling that on a on a uh, core level. So, I think that I think trauma and existential uh, fear really uh, interrelate. Um, I don't know if you want to say. I'll just say, I don't think we know the answer. That's why we're doing this research. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much.